Welcome to what I hope is the end of winter tour, Homemakers No Dig Garden, mid-February 2023. And before quite getting into the tour, I'd just love to say thank you very much to those of you who subscribe to my channel. And we're just about, well, getting very close to 600,000 subscribers now. And do please help me to get that last little bit for the next milestone. And also thank you to those of you who are members. And you can join on the button which is on the screen. Uh, it's a five pound fee a month and that we like to use to help community school garden projects with resources they might not be able to afford. So it's a really nice getting into a loop of money going around and helping with no dig um, in community gardens. We've recently also paid for a polytunnel uh, at a school in near Colchester in Essex and got a beautiful thank you card from them. And it sounds like they're having really good fun with that. So before we start the garden, I want to show you wood chip because there's a lot of questions about wood chip and it's such a variable product. And I've got two examples here to illustrate that. Both were delivered recently by different tree surgeons. And this guy clearly has a big chipper <laughs> and it looks like he's chipping big pieces of wood. And that's his mix, if you like. And that's been sitting there in a heap for five months. And this guy has a much finer chipper and oh, this is five months old as well. You can see it's already showing signs of going a bit composty and it's also more coniferous. That doesn't matter. Uh, it's very difficult to change soil pH. So just don't worry if you get a uh, conifer. It'll take maybe a little bit longer to break down, but it, it's more the size of the chip. And if you get big chips, look at this. This is <laughs> four year old here four-year-old wood chip that we've been sieving. So um, Adam has been here throwing throwing the wood chips from the big stuff at this sieve, four years old chips. And that's what comes out the front of the chipper, the big stuff. And look what comes out in the middle. So this is what goes through the sieve. So this is four-year-old big chips now sieved. And you can see it's still woody. You know, there's still a lot of wood in here, like you can see there that's all gone through the sieve, but there's also a lot of really nice composty stuff. Wood chip like that, I would not use as compost uh, unless I didn't mind having a quite a woody surface because you would notice then the surface of your bed would be looking something like that more. So it's just something to bear in mind, but it's potentially a source of great fertility uh, when you get this lovely fine black stuff. Okay, so now I can show you what's happened in the winter. For example, in the previous video, which was two months ago, this was broad beans. <laughs> I haven't touched it in all that time, uh, but it wasn't broad beans to make harvest this spring. I deliberately sown them early to get bigger plants that would um, add a bit of nitrogen maybe, and also add organic matter to the soil. It's just waiting to grow potatoes and frost has killed them. So there you go. But if you look here, in contrast, you can see broad beans are hardy plants. They do better if they're not sown too early before winter, or even in winter can work. These were sown in December, and we transplanted them here as quite small plants one month ago, in the middle of January, just before we had some really cold weather, well, cold for us, like minus seven centigrade, 19 Fahrenheit, quite a few nights of that and cold days. And those plants have survived. And if you notice how the fleece is sitting right on top of them. So you can do this with your spring plantings. You don't have to support the fleece. That holds the warmth closer to ground level where the plants are. And put your plants in deep. Like I'm always saying, put them in deep and don't fill in the holes, just let them fill in. This is rye. I don't know if you remember the rye. It's rye for grain that I'm looking to harvest in August to make bread, <laughs> have a little mill. There's a video about that if you want to look. If you see here what's going on, something's eating the rye, the leaves, and it's not a problem at the moment because it, it actually makes the plants tiller out, it's called, where they <clears throat> make more stems. And then there'll be, this will really fill. You know, you won't see any bare ground within about six weeks here. It'll just be thick green and whatever's eating them it's, it's either pheasant or rabbits or both 
that's fine <laughs> at this point. And, and even already the, the rye is able to grow faster than they can eat it. This was a patch of mustard, which was beautiful. Even in early December, it was thick green. It was all out here. This is a great way to grow a green manure or cover crop if you're now dig, because, well, you don't need to dig it in. <laughs> the frost kills it. And this is all that's left. You know, this was a huge amount of plants. And that's just the stems of the mustard now sitting on top. And if I wanted to sow carrots or something, I would just rake that off and just have a clear run. But it, you could plant into this, so I'm just leaving it now. And we haven't weeded that or anything. You know, the mustard's a great weed deterrent. Uh, you can see there's not many weeds here. I mean, this is classic no dig. We've done a, just a bit of light winter weeding. It's worth it. It doesn't take too long. These haven't survived too well. This is spring onions that are not really an overwintering variety. It's called Lilia. It's a red onion, actually. And I maybe won't try that again. We've had a run of mild winters recently, or not too cold, and I think we've got a bit slack in some of our habits. Here is a bit of new no dig. And this is one way of starting out from what you can see behind, which is weedy pasture in this case. It's, so it's grass and buttercups and dandelions and quite a bit of bindweed. And because of the bindweed, for me, that's a major reason to use black plastic as a one-off in the first few months only. Although actually this might stay here till September because we could plant squashes, winter squash, for example. <clears throat> you could plant zucchini as well. They're quite suitable because you need a wide spacing. So a whole meter apart, you don't need many holes in the plastic to grow a lot of food while the plastic is killing the weeds, still dying. And on the ground there, under the plastic, we've put just five centimeters, two inches. Every year I'm trying a little less. <laughs> I get asked the question a lot, you know, I totally get it. People say, I couldn't do no dicks, I can't get a load of compost. Fair enough. You don't actually need a huge amount. You can use a lot, and I often recommend that, but it's not vital. So, you know, consider all options. Uh, there are ways and means. The broccoli here, oh, look at this. This hasn't happened for a very long time, <clears throat> this level of damage. I've lost about half the plants, so there's 40 plants originally, now there's 20 survived. It's a variety called claret. It's for cropping in April or being well. And it didn't like the frost. After the last video we tour we did here, we then had two of the coldest nights of the winter. It went down to minus nine centigrade, 16 Fahrenheit roughly. However, I've, I've grown broccoli before, which has stood temperatures lower than that. And what I'm noticing this winter is it's more damaged than, than they should be, I feel. You know, I don't quite know what's going on, but it just feels a bit like things haven't gone quite to plan according to the temperature we have. Here I'm showing you, no dig, this is homemade compost spread on top. What I'm going to do <clears throat> is a light raking. This is no dig bed prep if you like. So just a light raking over the top. In fact it hardly needs it. You can see how soft this compost is. If you had more lumps, if you spread animal manure say which was a bit lumpy in December, you, you'll find that you could just skim over like this. It's a skim. <clears throat> this is not a deep soil movement or compost movement of any kind. You can see now how level it is. This is also a chance if you want, you can just flick those into the pathway. You could get a very clean surface and, you know, you could sow carrots in that. Look how beautiful that is. So that's one starting point for getting a bed ready and then getting a, some seeds in. We're doing mostly transplants, so we just dip a hole. You've got those two options. <clears throat> There's a bit of garlic here, which, <laughs> well, we bought this garlic uh, from a shop just to see, and it's not seed garlic, and it looked beautiful cloves, popped them in in October, and at the same time popped in some homegrown, home saved hardneck, actually. This is softneck, so not, it's not a light like for light comparison, but this is not looking too happy. I think it might recover though. That one doesn't look too good. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I, I just like trying things. You know, it's, it's the way to learn. Try a few different things always and see how they compare. This is classic no dig. Look at that. So this cardboard went down about a month ago. And in fact, it was in very frosty weather in January. And you can do that. That doesn't matter at all. That's all thawed out. The temperature goes down and comes up. <laughs> so this is a new bed and the cardboard is suppressing the weed growth while it's trying to regrow as well as we've obviously got the compost on top around about four inches, 10 centimeters, and a bit of wood chip just to keep the cardboard down around the edge. That's pretty classic 
a nice formula that works in many situations. Just make sure you use reasonably thick cardboard, take all the tape off and overlap it. You can see how these are all overlapped. There's actually quite a few, especially along the edge, because that's where the grass is going to try and spread in uh, all the time. And in fact, while we're here, we could see this is a bed made only 18 months ago. And you can see how already we've got, you know, a very nice edge there. That's just through cardboard, really. And not much compost has gone there. So that's homemaker soil. And we've got beautiful spinach plants. That's a variety called Winter Giant which I don't normally grow and I was given some seeds by Sutton's in fact and I thought well I'll, okay I'll grow it and I'm really glad I did because just for once it's really had a winter to show off what it can do and that's winter giant and that's a variety called F1 Rubino which isn't hasn't been so good over winter uh, but it's still nice spinach and that one is winter green spring cabbage for early greens which is of all the cabbages I've grown has actually done the best this winter in these extreme conditions well, extreme for us. And in the shed, you can see, we're not gonna spend long in here. I just wanna show you a couple of things though. Like, look at these. And that, really firm. You know, that's a great way to store beetroot. If you can grow them nice and big, big roots are still good, they're not woody. And they store really well, because there's much higher proportion of middle to surface area. It's sprouting a bit, that's normal. It's a living, organism. Uh, same thing going on here with carrots for example, so there's the sprout of carrot. I've actually set aside some of these, some of the nicest ones that I'm going to plant. I'm actually going to make a hole to get them in the ground to grow for seed. So these, and we've also set aside some beetroots, you, you can, eight or ten of each, plant them out quite close in a new bed somewhere and you get flower stems and then seeds. And here we have a bit of worm compost. So the wormery that I set going last year, I'll make a video about this later in the year, but that's what it has produced. And we've got quite a few sackfuls and for use in potting and containers. There are so many ways to make compost and it's not like you need tons of compost for no dig, but if you can get really nice quality compost, whether you're no dig or not, actually, you will just get crops that are more beautiful and easy and worthwhile and fewer weeds and even these poor things they're being really well they've been stripped by the pigeons <laughs> but because they pretty much finished cropping on if you look at these stems you can see how many brussels sprouts we've had huge harvest being really worthwhile and we're still getting some you know those actually are really nice to eat and they're pretty clean too there's not much trimming i know they're not very big but there's still quite a lot that are very easy to gather now thanks to the pigeons clearing the way Whereas here, we've had not good winter survival. And this is something that, for me, is normally a banker in the winter. Look at this. Just look at this. That's a Swede. Uh, this is blowing me away. What's going on here? You know, that, that's not normal. I've never in my life seen a Swede do that with the temperatures we've had. So this is disappointing. Whereas the lamb's lettuce is in between. You know, you can see the soil's okay. <laughs> They're growing all right. And here with the spinach, this is like a catalogue of disasters here. <laughs> Don't want to depress you too much, but we, we've had some virus problem. And I'm not sure where that's come from, but that's pretty much, um, you can see all that yellow, it's not looking good. And how many plants have gone basically. So I'm starting again, new seed, and we've got one bed of spinach actually that's still okay. The spring onions have mostly survived down there, but they are looking bedraggled. I'm pointing out these things and, and how things are not looking great at the moment to encourage you because I think sometimes people worry. I mean, I worry too. You know, it's like it doesn't look good at this time, but it's the spinach is going to grow again, some of it, <laughs> but it's more the spring onions. So they're, they'll be good. You know, we'll come back and look at them in a couple of tours' time, maybe. You'll see the difference. You can see there's a lot of beds here ready. Classic no dig. We put a bit of compost on, two to three centimeters, about an inch on the beds, and same depth of reasonably well rotted wood chip on the path. So there you go, that's the previous path level. So in these pathways, there's no cardboard or membrane, nothing underneath, it's just old <laughs> wood chip. Uh, but actually, if we just look at this path, look, look how soft this soil is underneath the wood chip. This is ground that we're walking on all the time. And the soil is good, basically. There's nice soil there. Doesn't grow weeds much, 
we do a bit of hand weeding. But basically what it means is in having no wooden sides, the plants can root into the path soil through the season and we're getting value from the paths. These are cabbages that haven't survived the winter very well. This again has really surprised me. That's a variety called Durham Elf. So I've been learning a few lessons this winter and garlic is performing well as usual at this time of year. And this is where we also did the over sowing of mustard. So we sowed mustard at the same time as planting garlic around the middle of October last year. And you couldn't see the garlic. It was like November, December, where's the garlic? The mustard was up here. And then you get a hard frost and it goes whoom, and turns into that. I haven't touched this bed since uh, October. You know, the, the mustard was there, now it's died. Now we can see the garlic. What I'm hoping is that the extra life maybe in the soil, the microbiology will give extra health to the garlic and then it won't get so much rust because we're getting so much rust. It's really becoming quite a problem. Compost making, lovely things happening here, even in the middle of February. We've had a bonus though, because uh, what we realized was I got some, some of the old meadow up there, which is still stalky from last year and flower and weed stems. It's been difficult for my little mower to cut, but on a frosty morning, Adam and I were looking at it and I thought, right, this could be mown. And so he got going with his mower. And that's what all of this is, it's just, um, the top of the meadow and you see the steam there it's actually warm it's hotter than a hot bath even at this time of year in february and a little bit dry that's interesting too it looks to me like this needs a bit of water uh, so we're putting on cardboard and paper dry and that one is still dry <laughs> that's partly because wood chips are always drier than you think and they seem to dry out a bit even when they're in a heap so this is moist but i could do with a bit more uh, water not much, we won't do that a lot. It's more, as we come into spring, the leaves going on will be green and fresh, so that won't be an issue anymore. In fact, I will just mention here, since we're passing it, this is the most mature compost of the whole run. So we've got successive bays coming down, and this is what we're using at the moment. So that is my imperfect compost. You can see the bits of wood in there occasional lumps, all of that goes on the beds exactly as you see it without any sieving or anything. The sieving I mentioned before was just for wood chip that we've got huge pieces in, but the bits of wood I'm seeing here are not a problem and they're soft, they're starting to decay. So that is all good and that will make nice fungal populations on and near the surface of the beds. Look at this, <laughs> four cauliflowers. Last time we were here, this bed was full of healthy cauliflower plants. The idea of these is that they crop in April. <laughs> we'll get a very few. It's a marginal one. Uh, more than I realized, actually. I, I think cauliflowers are not so hardy. Um, still worth trying because it wasn't much work to do that. You know, with no dig, you, you put things in the ground. Once you've got your beds clean like this, like that garlic in the ground, there's not much else to do before harvest, really. Uh, just a bit of weeding. It doesn't take very long. So this is where it all begins. And you can see we've been doing some propagating already. Like these radish were sown on the 13th of February. Now it's the 17th, that's four days. They've been in the conservatory. So I start all my seeds for the germination phase, this bit under cover in the house because it's warmer at night than in here. And I've just brought them out just half an hour ago. So that's why they're looking yellow. They've been in the conservatory. If they stay there much longer, they would start to draw upwards and get leggy plants. So that's why as soon as you see them get to this sort of level, you, they need to be in full light. However you do that, whether it's outside or with grow lights. And germinating spinach, same story, onions. Uh, you see quite a few things. I've been doing some early sowing before my normal recommended time because we've been trying out seeds. This is home saved onion seed. I just wanted to check. Very happy with that. That's multi-sown. You can find out more about multi-sown on various videos. I've put up a page on my website and we're gonna make a video about that as well. So these multi-sown onions go in as clumps and you get four or five onions growing all together. And you might have noticed there's some tomatoes here. What are they doing at this time of year? These are shoots I overwinter. So it's a variety 
um, we put up a short about this last August, actually. It was really popular. Um, people are intrigued by this idea. So you take a sucker or side shoot, and in this case in October, you just put it in compost. I did this one just a month ago in January, and then I had it in the house. This is just compost, no rooting powder or anything like that. It's just a sucker side shoot of tomato in compost. You get a new plant. So you could even make new plants from these ones now. There's one. So <laughs> it's got aphids on as well. Don't worry about that. That's kind of normal. Flick them off, give them a bit of water. At this time of year, you see a lot of aphids. I, and you, plants just grow through them until the ladybirds arrive or whatever. You, you could put that in a bit of compost like that. Um, just bury it in compost, basically. And that will give you another plant. So those are ideas. The reason I'm doing this is because this is a F1 variety, so it doesn't grow true from seed. And therefore you can't keep the seeds, well you can keep the seeds, but they won't grow true. So, but the sucker, you're making a clone if you like, and that does grow true and you get uh, a new plant. And you can see we're doing in intensive salad cropping in here. We've done about seven picks off these plants already. Huge amounts of leaves have come out of here and there's loads more to come. And there's been no compost or anything put on this soil since last May. I'm not using fecal fertilizers, it's just compost and no dig soil microbes. This is something I just wanted to mention, it's a bit different, uh, wild rocket. So wild rocket is not the same as salad rocket. Wild rocket crops much better in the spring when salad rocket is trying to go to flower. Like from now, salad rocket's making flower stems. This one isn't, it's making lots of leaves until June, pretty much, and these seeds were sown in September in, in my little module trays and then pricked out and then potted on into these in December. So these have been sitting here all through the winter in the cold, uh, unheated greenhouse, but with, we put fleece over if it's really frosty, that does help. And this space is where I'm going to make a hotbed, so we'll see that on the next tour. And this is basically making a hotbed is like a compost heap but it's fresh horse manure, so that's horse poo and straw here, and that'll make a, like a heat source for helping to germinate and grow seedlings. And there's two more things I want to show you. One is the small garden, which leads into planning. So, the space. <laughs> you have your space. There we have 25 square metres, three beds of roughly four metres long each. What are we going to grow there? Well, Already there's some things growing, so that any plan has to allow for that. And I actually shared this just now on social media, and I was intrigued by the comments, and pleased actually, because, um, <laughs> it's you know, I love the things that people say, like someone said, oh, you've got doctors writing. Yeah, that's true. And then they said, oh, this is so nice, and it's not a spreadsheet, you know, it's just a rough plan. And that's all you need. But it's getting ideas, and this could change still, but for example, over there we got this matches, so we got spinach, and that's the spinach there. And I'm thinking that will go on until about May, then I could plant cucumbers, even early June. So you're looking for things to follow, which will time correctly. It's not, I'm not worrying about rotation. There's an empty space over there, could be carrots. Empty space over here could be calabrese, that's early green broccoli. There we got swedes already, rutabagas, and they could be followed by, for example, tall peas. Uh, they'll soon be gone, the peas will go in. And the tall peas could be followed by chicory, like to make radicchio hearts in the autumn. So I'm just thinking at this, these, none of this is written in stone, but it's getting down these first ideas. Planning can seem daunting, I reckon. Uh, well, I, even I find that now, uh, especially when you look at the beginning, it has so much space and then so many possibilities. But write some down, just write some ideas down and gradually things will start to take shape. And even then through the early spring, you're making your first plantings, could be lettuce and onion, spring onions, radish, for example. And what, they start to fill up the space a bit and then you see it becomes clearer. You've got a bit more of a framework then. So often the really hard bit is those first decisions, where to put the first plantings. These bottom doors I keep in all the time and they keep out the rabbits and the dogs and the cats and it means that I don't actually need to shut the doors at all. These main doors stay open all winter. I haven't shut them once this winter, even in that really cold weather. But what we have done over these plants in the really cold weather is put fleece over. And we actually trialed using hoops for the fleece or not on the side beds. They were just, fleece was right on them. And it was fine in all ways. 
And look at these plants. These have been in the ground here since October. They've been through all that frost. It gets really cold in here. It was minus seven outside one morning. I looked at the thermometer there, minus seven. <laughs> so, you know, these, these, these are plants that resist the winter. And I'm just gonna show you how they, how well, um, well, most of them are looking. This one, in fact, we've had some losses here and that's what these radish are filling the gaps, multi-sown radish. Here's a plant that might need to be replaced. It's not really looking brilliant. This is more correct. This is Grenoble Red, fantastic variety for winter. Comes from the French Alps, it's really hardy. And what we do to pick them is take off the outer leaves, never using a knife, just removing the outermost leaves and that leaves the plant in a really good place for growing on. So this plant was sown in September, planted October, started cropping late November, December, January, February. It's five months old, still going, and it could go on until May or June. And it'd be the same for all these plants, all being well, they'll crop until we need them, basically. Then the outside plantings will take over. So now we're concentrating on that next phase, which is more sowings. And we have just passed that threshold time mid-February when it's it's good from now on to sow the cold hardy vegetables, not yet things like tomatoes. I actually don't sow tomatoes till 10th of May. I'll look forward on the next tour to catching up with you on some of that and all the sowings you can make through the spring. Do have a look at my wall calendar and my sowing timeline. There's a lot of free resources, some that you can buy to keep you on track with all your sowings. Don't try and sow everything at once. Sowing is something you can do right the way through the year until even October. Uh, November for the broad beans that we saw up there in December. <laughs> so enjoy the year, the start of the year, and I look forward to seeing you in March.